Hello, this is Greg Allison from Galactic Gregs, coming to you from an undisclosed location, somewhere in the Milky Way galaxy. The presentation I'm going to show you now is by a pioneer in digital co computing, talking about the Saturn V computers, the launch vehicle digital computer, and the analog computers for both Saturn V, the Skylab mission, and he's going to go further and talk about uh, his work with Patriot Missile and his work in the commercial world, all this at IBM working on uh, printer development and all kind of things of early computing. He even talks about how he started getting into things before there was digital, working in vacuum cubes. Uh, the presenter tonight is Luke Talley, and he is making this presentation to the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society, a Huntsville, Alabama chapter of the National Space Society, which I am president of. So I hope you enjoy this presentation. It's a very interesting presentation, especially if you're into electrical engineering, computers, and the history and the beginnings of digital computing and guidance. I think you will enjoy it. I'll be doing a lot more programs like this and a lot of other space and science presentations on this channel. So if you've not already subscribed, please subscribe to my channel and bang the update notification bell to get uh, notifications for future programs. And support this channel you can help me out by clicking the links below from my sister channel, Green Gregs, because we are somewhat related. Hello, I'm Greg Allison, president of the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society, and we're the local chapter of the National Space Society. We have monthly programs, usually here at the library, sometimes other places, or we try to most every month, that are public outreach programs. We do have a little project still developing hybrid rockets and other rocket technology up in Gurley. It's a side project we call High Altitude Liftoff. We made the Guinness Book of World Records several years ago for launching a hybrid rocket from High Altitude Balloon out over the Atlantic Ocean. And we've also got a rocket hanging a straight to El Brewery. It was our Space Launch 2 rocket. So we've had some adventures in HAL 5. We've done conferences, including Power Grid Defense and other events in the past. Tonight's program, we have uh, Mr. Luke Talley. He's a pioneer in digital computers, as he was one of the guys involved early on in our Saturn V computer and instrument ring. And so uh, he, he also spoke to us at the uh, 50th anniversary panel we had a couple of months ago at Straight Ale Brewery. And uh, he worked for IBM and uh, quite a few other people, and he did kind of activity similar to some things I'm doing with the, the Space Launch System SEAL today. So, ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, I give you Mr. Luke Talley. Okay, uh, I guess a couple of months ago, talking to David about various things we had done. So he said, well, how about tell us a little bit of what, what you did. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, you're space enthusiasts and so forth. So I hate to tell you that a lot of this thing will have a lot to do with space and so forth. But I was born in September 41 in Montgomery, and uh, about 75 days later, World War II started, and that kind of changed everything for everybody. Uh, a couple of years later, my dad uh, joined the Navy because they were getting rid of the draft's fathers. Thought he would have a better chance. And he left the Pacific in uh, August of 44 and uh, never returned. So. My mother and grandmother pretty well raised me as all the way through, and they encouraged this stuff. So uh, I started early. Uh, technology in the 40s and the 50s was radio, so no matter what you did, you fiddled around with radios. I uh, started out in first grade. We moved back out to the house where my mom and dad had built, and uh, I'd beat anybody I could find out of some wires and stuff, and I could make electromagnets and we all, everybody, all the kids in those days made uh, telegraphs out of an old tin can and some nails and some wire around, wound around. Then about fifth grade, crystal radio, eighth grade, my grandmother decided I needed to meet this guy that owned an electronics place there in Montgomery, a distributor, so he was a friend of the family. So I went to him and found out that he would sell me vacuum tubes and so forth that wholesale prices so I'd somebody come in my radio doesn't work well, okay so I take a sack full of tubes get on the bus go downtown check the tubes find which one's bad 
buy it for 50 and 10 off and sell it to them for retail, so it made a little extra money. In ninth grade, first exposure to a transistor, I built a one transistor radio, that 2 and 107. The way the transistor, I'm going to probably get a little more deep than some of you want, but it's not too bad. That particular one, the way the base emitter circuit was, it worked great as a modulator for AM radio, and then the collector emitter was a nice little amplifier, so you didn't have to use a high impedance headset, you could just use a little low impedance earplug. So I got in trouble in a few classes because the radiator made a real good antenna. So, <laughs> 10th through 12th grade, a friend of ours opened a uh, hobby shop there in Montgomery, and I was too young to work, but I worked anyway. So I made extra spending money and bought a tube checker so I didn't have to catch the bus and go downtown and check them. I could check them right then and there. And then television came along, and uh, UHF in Montgomery, they had these little 6AF4 tubes that just conked out over and over. I made a killing off of them. So anyway, First exposure to computers now was uh, SAGE. I don't know if you all remember SAGE or not, but this was our first air defense system. We were going to build one of these things in Montgomery, and they were talking about these computers. <laughs> People in Montgomery, we didn't know what a computer was. So the neat thing to me was, is, you know, I've got this new tube checker. These things had 55,000 tubes in each one, and I just thought, man, can you imagine the money I could make checking all those tubes? <laughs> so, suppose the largest computer ever built, 250 tons. This was the uh, jumping off place. It was built by, uh, designed by MIT, well, MIT MITRE, MIT Research and Engineering, and then IBM actually built the thing. and. Uh, it into production and then they used a, a version of this as was used in the IBM system was called Sabre which was the first uh, airline uh, reservation system that you saw around the country so this was really a, a jumping off place for a lot of people for me I don't know I uh, like I say we <laughs> most of us still didn't have a clue what it was so I worked in a hobby shop, and then by high school graduation, I built radios and this stuff. I worked in a hobby shop. I was an average student. I never really busted the curve, at least not at the top of it. So college years come along, and it turns out about 19, I graduated in 59. In 1956, the uh, War Orphans Educational Assistance Act was passed, it's the GI Bill. So if your father or mother died in World War II, then they would pay you a certain amount of money to go to school. It was what, 110 a month for nine months a year for four years. And uh, this would have about been impossible for us if it had not been for this. So I always have to say thank you, America, for that. Uh, college comes along, and I'm going to the University of Alabama in electrical engineering. Uh, didn't cover all the... GI Bill thing, didn't cover everything, so worked in summers and saved the extra money to pay for books and things for the next year. Summer job in Montgomery with this guy that had been selling me those radar, radio tubes all the year, so it turned out to be a pretty good deal. I learned probably as much there as I did in college. <laughs> Electrical Engineering University of Alabama. Uh, at the time vacuum tubes were in, that was what everything was made out of. But transistors were coming, and the university was not real sure about what to do about that. So they added 20 hours to our requirement for a bachelor's degree in double E. So that took a little longer. Plus, I, like I say, I never busted the top of the curve. Uh, coursework was pretty much analog-based. We really didn't have much uh, digital of any kind at the time. Uh, graduated with a BS and double E in power and controls with, with not much, essentially no digital. The only, uh, at the time, the only digital computer in, Tus in the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa was in the business school. Funny story. They put this new Univac computer in and decided they were going to have Dr. Rose come over. Well, Dr. Rose, you know, he was this, uh, you know, real 
<laughs> what we would say down south, I'm an uppity guy. And so he's standing there, and they got the Univac machine running. And remember how you'd print out and you'd have the big letters, you know? So it comes out, Dr. Rose, Univac welcomes you, and all this kind of stuff, and it's printing away. And everybody, oh, wow, wow, you know? And then it stops and pauses, you know, in a few minutes it starts up again, and it starts printing these giant letters, you know, and everybody's standing, oh, that's, that looks like a, yeah, that's a U, yeah, that's a, oh, a Univac, Univac, oh, yeah, yeah. It says, Univac says, oh, yeah, 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 screw you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ms. Rose kind of fainted. Dr. Rose says, give me that. He said, I'm going to keep that. So, oh, well, good story anyway. Okay. So my official working career, 50 plus years, 65 to 2016. Uh, Probably you say this this kid couldn't keep a job. <laughs> so started out, came here right out of school, Federal Electric out in the Qual Lab for a while. Then uh, talked about it in a minute, went to IBM, stayed here until 1980. IBM pretty well shut down the shop here for all practical purposes. Went to Charlotte, North Carolina with IBM in the commercial division. Uh, printers for a while, they sent me back to computer science school. And then IBM commercial and banking systems, uh, check processing development, and then came back and worked back on the Patriot again until 2016. So, start off, Qual Lab job, Saturn ground equipment. I've talked to a number of people. I'm a docent over at Space and Rocket Center, and we get a lot of people coming through that are working on current space projects and one thing or another. And we go back to this, and we were validating the checkout procedures for the electrical support equipment that would go into the Cape, into the VAB and on the, on the launcher. And so we would sit there, and we would take this procedure, and you know, turn switch A to position one or auto or on or whatever, and then we would take the schematics and a yellow marker, and we would yellow line every thing that got energized by that action. And we'd keep this little logbook and we've got we've yellow lined our schematics. And we would spend many, many, many hours doing this. And then we get done, we go through these pages and pages of schematics. These would be the ground equipment schematics and the stage schematics, and make sure that everything had been tested. There had to be yellow lines everywhere. If there was a line that wasn't yellow, then we'd write up and hey, you know, miss so and so on such and such. This, to me, is a very good example of the meticulous testing that went on in the days of Saturn that I think a lot of young folks don't understand how important that really is. Okay, so the, one of the guys I work with says, look, 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 you need to get some of that digital stuff. Well, you need to know. I didn't know one from a zero. So <laughs> he sent me off to, went over to IBM. I'm still working for Federal Electric and take this digital techniques class. Now these are some of the classes that were taught as part of the Saturn program. When people come in and say, why are we going to the moon? Why are we going to Mars? And my answer is that these large research and development programs, the things that you get out of it, you have a, a limited number of experts in an area, they will teach classes, and you will take these classes and then the program will end and you'll go off somewhere else and you'll apply what you learn. This to me was just, you know, this is the beginning. And I, this is kind of like a treasure book for me. Anyway. So, took the class and boy, that's pretty neat. Went back and did some other stuff. Well, July of 66, they said, Luke, I want you to go over to the IBM facility and help them set up their electrical support equipment for testing the IU. Fine to me, I'll go over there and do whatever. So I went over there and uh, NASA had uh, the Saturn V instrument unit and the Saturn 1B instrument unit are almost the same. Okay, very, very similar. So the NASA guy said, hey, look, you know, all we can do is we just buy the 1B equipment, field engineering, change it to get it to look like five and go. We save a ton of money and a lot of time. GE makes the equipment, and they said, no, nah, we ain't gonna do that. So they sent me over there to write field engineering changes. Well, I did that for July to December. And one day, 
I go out to get in my car, and there's an envelope on the seat. Open it up, and it's an application to IBM, and it has a note that says, fill this out, turn it into personnel tomorrow. So I, a good idea to me, because we were about to lose our contract anyway. So filled it out, turned it in, and uh, I still, I do not know who left that envelope in my car. Probably the most significant event of my career. By January, I was working for IBM and spent 31 years working for them. So that's where this all got started. And uh, IBM facility, I know you all have seen these buildings that you go across the overpass now down on Spartan off to the left. A couple of UAH buildings with three stories, the administrative and engineering. And then the one story building, which I think right now is vacant, is Excuse me, it was the manufacturing and test Actually, building. Actually, being rented by Dynamics right now. Pardon? <laughs> Dynamics, okay. Yeah, it goes to somebody every other week. Okay. Yeah, I, my daughter studies computer science in those buildings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I went to work at IBM in the flight evaluation department. And our job was to evaluate the telemetry from when I first started. It was primarily electrical telemetry and the environmental control system, and then got into the RF computer and the guidance navigation control, identified anything that was wrong, what failed, what didn't, uh, things that didn't work right, and then we worked with the system and component folks to resolve anything, uh, you know, any issues that came along. In 68, they were talking, there was some issue, and frankly, I don't even remember what it was, it has to do with the LVDC and the acoustic delay lines. I know what acoustic delay line is. They were buffer memories in those days. You basically have just this little quartz crystal in shape like a hexagon or a pentagon, and you, you pump a pulse in here and it bounces around in there and finally comes out the other side, and that how long it takes to bounce around in there is your delay. So it gives you a little buffer memory, a little bit different way of thinking of things. But this was my first real experience with uh, processors. Okay, now, at this point, I'm not sure exactly what I was supposed to tell you folks, so this is what I'm going to tell you. All right. The instrument unit on Saturn used two, used a digital computer and an analog computer, okay? The LVDC was the processor and the memory. The LVDA was the input-output, and the flight control computer uh, was an analog computer. Uh, the... The basic idea here of this digital and analog combination was a, an outgrowth of what IBM had done on the Titan II missile. The early Saturn uh, flights that had the uh, ASC-15, I believe it was, computer was the, the Titan version, and this was an upgraded deal. So we have a processor now with 18 instructions, but not a whole lot. Averages 8,700 instructions a second. Uh, word size 28 bits. Uh, need 26 bits to do the job, and then two bits per. Uh, they actually use uh, two 13-bit syllables for instructions and so on. And the memory, two 16,000-word memories. I still it just blows my mind. It was written in a language called LVDC Assembler. Real neat name. And the daddy of that was uh, Jim Medlock. So everybody knows Jim Medlock, I think, in Huntsville, just about integraph daddy. Okay. So no real operating system. You operate in a two-second loop, and you have interrupts coming in. Uh, Average is about two seconds. Uh, 25 times a second to get an interrupt to go out and read the uh, guidance, the platform, and do those computations, and that takes about 20, I think, seconds or so. So uh, the rest of the things, you, you get interrupted to go do whatever. Okay, so it's not, there was not a Windows for Saturn. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the circuitry now mounted in page assemblies. This thing over here on the, what's this? Goes on there. Over here on the right, the thing's actually made in two halves. Then you have the port board, you have 35 circuits. The circuits, <coughs> excuse me, 
unit logic devices, they call them, and they're called hybrids. Uh, not an integrated circuit. The spacecraft had some integrated circuits, but we did not have any. 12 layer circuit board that these things mount on. What's uh, the rough dimension? Say again. The rough it's, it's roughly three by four or something like that. Small, little small cars. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, I think this thing. Yes. <laughs> okay. I've got a piece here, and uh, you can look at afterward. This is a actually a thing I made about 50 something years ago a little block of uh, just casting resin and I put some of these things in the thing on the left now is a pencil eraser with the transistors each uh, transistor was 25 thousandths of an inch square so in that center hold on I got a better slide okay the, the center piece up there over here on the right the center one the two little squares of the transistors, the silver parts of the conductor pattern. So the base of it is an aluminum uh, ceramic. On the bottom are the, are the uh, resistors. And if you, ha, ah, I got a pointer. <laughs> <laughs> These little thingies right here that are cut away, it's actually they used a, uh, an abrasive, just a little sandblaster to blast those things away. So, Hook it up on a bridge and start blasting away until you got 1,200 ohms, and that's it. So, at the time, they tried lasers, but it, apparently at this time, there were two lasers in the world. One was delicate eye surgery, and the other was vaporized bulldozer. And so neither one would work on this. <laughs> it tended to do a lot of extra damage, so they stuck with the little abrasive thing. So the little transistors up there, I mean, excuse me, the conductor patterns and the resistors are printed with a silk screen, put it in an oven, fire it, bring it out. The transistors now, if this, if you can see, if you, look, if you look at those little transistors, there are three tiny little solder balls on the bottom of each. Okay, so you have the conductor pattern, you stand that thing up on the little solder balls, put it in another oven and heat it up, and you can see on the bottom the transistor now is sitting on the solder ball. As the solder balls melt, the surface tension aligns them with the, uh, with the uh, conductor pattern. They tried all kinds of neat tricks to do that. That turned out to work better than just about anything they could find. Okay. All right, one LEDC transistor, 25 thousandths of an inch square, eight, <coughs> say eight per 0.3, the little ceramic sub the ULV is 0.3 inches, so that's roughly 75 transistors per square inch, best you can do. Next generation IBM system is 30 billion transistors in a point, in a roughly one inch square chip, okay? So roughly 33 billion. <coughs> so in the space of one of these transistors we used in Saturn, you can put 18 billion today, 18 million today. And that to me is probably about as good a then versus now comparison that you can make. Uh, if you did, I'm out of time. I have time, I'll come back. Okay? So that's kind of my discussion on the, the Saturn device and kind of how it compares to today. All right, now, this thing, Saturn was, uh, as far as you know, we were down to about Apollo 15, I think, is when uh, one of the guys came and said, hey, Luke, I need some help on Skylab. Would you come over and uh, help me? And I'll you know, see what I can do. Uh, I was... Okay, hold on. Here we go. Skylab computer. Okay. So I was working in the Skylab technical program office. They had a... They had a administrative office and a technical office. So I was in the technical. Lead engineer on an effort to provide an uplink uh, reload of the computer from the uh, manned spaceflight network. And then we did a 24-7 mission support. We actually had a room over at the IBM site. We were tied in with the people in Houston throughout the Skylab mission. So about this time, I had to start going back to UAH over here and take some classes because they were talking about CMGs and momentum management. 
And boy, if you want to torque your head right out of the socket, just go try to understand that stuff. I tried in uh, 72 to 78, uh, did this for a while, and we'll come back to some other things, but for now. The problem we had was the reliability objective was 97% chance of making a 240-day mission. Okay, the field, the Failure effects analysis said, well, you guys probably might make 87%. Said, hey, you better do something. Okay, we'll do something. So how do you do that? The core memory turned out to be a significant contributor just by the sheer amount of stuff that's in there. Okay, so Skylab operated with two computers, one on and one off. In the case of the LVDC, we had triple redundant logic and we had dual redundant memories. That's a very short mission, 11 hours, okay, and it's pretty well done. So here we've got 240 days, a lot more time, so we really can't have triple redundant stuff in this thing. We did have a small little piece of triple redundant, but it was a very short, very small number of parts, and this is for the automatic switchover between the computers if one of them quit working. Okay, so each a 16K memory was made up of two 8,000 uh, 8K uh, memory modules, and they could be operated independently of each other, so just by addressing them differently. So the first upgrade was we create a flight program run only in the 8K memory, and that reduces some capability, but we can still save the primary mission. <coughs> Add a way to load either 16K or 8K from an onboard tape recorder that we put on the on Skylab, so that was the change that went through. 8K plus the memory load unit tape recorder capability helped, still didn't get 97%. Uh, back to the okay. So, upgrade number three. We're going to load the 8K and the 16K memory using a radio frequency uplink. Right. So we would take instrumentation tapes. Ted knows all about these. Mm -hmm. Instrumentation tapes, 14 inch diameter tapes, uh, one inch wide, 14 tracks, basically an analog recording scheme. So we would, I'll come back to it. <laughs> so basically, what we would do is the onboard tape recorder loaded at 72 kilobits. So we could load an 8K in five and a half seconds and a 16K in 11 seconds. So we wanted to provide that capability. One of the guys at IBM gets to messing around and says, hey, you know that command receiver we got down there? We're only using this much of the bandwidth. It can handle 72 kilobits. So, well, so we got So we decided we would produce this thing, use the command system to set up in the receive mode for the MLU, and then the guy on the ground starts his tape, just plays it back through a recorder. We had a whole bunch of extra bits strung out on this thing, and we're transmitting bits left and right. The onboard system sees, them, sees the start, loads the computer, and hits the start button for the computer and shuts the MLU off and everybody's happy. So that was the idea. So it showed that, hey, if we do this, you want a picture of that? If we do this, we can meet the 97%. So our NASA guy came to me and said, Luke, I want you to work on this because if I have to get these NASA centers to talking to one another, we'll never get there. <laughs> the only way it's going to happen is to get a contractor to talk to these people. So there went all my ones and zero knowledge, you know, down the tubes. I got to go talk with these NASA people. So anyway, <laughs> sorry, NASA folks. <laughs> um, was the 97 percent goal an uh, arbitrary number? Or no, that was that was the you know NASA goal. Probably was contract kind of a thing, but I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Yeah, okay. All right, so this was kind of a, this is maybe more than you ever wanted to know, but you're going to send this single stream of data up to this thing, so you've got to have some way of generate, some way of clocking the data, because if you look right up here, and use this fancy corner I wrote today, look right up here, you see you got a string of ones, and on a tape, if you the tape's only going to respond to changes, okay? So if I do that, it'll change and then it just kind of drifts off to nothing and then it'll change again. So I lose that information. So how do I get clocking data together? Well, you go to the biphase and code the deal where 
the one, if you have a transition in the middle of a bit time from a zero to a one, it's a uh, zero, and if it's from a high to the low, then it's a one bit. So not only that, but doing the Manchester encoding, you can regenerate your clock. So when the signal comes up, and this tape on the ground's got wow and stuff on it, so your clock follows what's going on. So you're loading this stuff. Uh, it worked very well. The only thing about it was, well, my job was to make that work. We had to determine the op optimum modulation index. If you over-modulate or under-modulate, then the data getting received gets uh, jagged edges on the end of the transitions and it don't work with flip. So coordinate between the three centers. <laughs> Fun days. Fun days. <clears throat> Verify was come it would work with the G Goddard equipment. We took this stuff up to Goddard and did it. Generated the uh, instrumentation tapes here in our ground station at IBM. And then we developed the procedures with uh, primarily with Goddard and uh, Houston for how to how to do this thing. Fun part. Stupid computer never did fail. <laughs> <laughs> so those unreliable core memories work pretty doggone good. So the last day we're going to power down. Hey, look, let's see if it worked. Mm -hmm. Tighten up the puckers, guys. So we went out and reloaded from the onboard tape, reloaded from the ground. Everything was successful. And that was the first time as we did I know of that we had ever loaded a complete uh -huh. machine from the ground, as far as I know. You never had to do it. Never, never had to do it, but we did it when we did it. So, <laughs> so <laughs> whatever. Okay, kind of a combination now. <clears throat> give you the, get back to the ones and zeros. Between the Skylab and the Saturn, small scale integration, about 100 transistors per IC in the Skylab. No, still no microprocessors yet. Uh, T squared L, the computer in the LVDC, LVDA, they say is diode transistor, and I'm not sure. It, it looks to me it's sort of a combination of resistor and diode. They didn't ask me, so we'll just say it's DTO. Customized model of the, what's called a TC1, tactical computer. IBM had used this in a number of Navy uh, weapon systems. Uh, part of the AP 101, which became the AP-101 series was the shuttle, uh, was used on the shuttle. Not, it didn't look, look anything like this computer, I guarantee you. Access time, about eight times the Saturn, 54 instructions versus 18, no more capability. 60,000 instructions per second maximum. Saturn was 11,500, uh, and that's if you just do add, 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 and spin by your squat. Uh, <laughs> typical uh, flight program, it would execute about 8,700. Uh, now, one day, it's, it's 1978, I'm here and I'm working on Patriot, Army Patriot missile. And we're shooting down airplanes now. We're not messing around with going to the moon. And we get this phone call from one of the NASA guys at Astronautics. He says, hey, uh, either you guys over there remember how to power Skylab back up. <laughs> what? So, Tom Kuhn, who's a super smart guy, He's a software guy. I don't know y'all. Anybody know Tom? If you do, you know him a fine gentleman. And he was more of the software and control system. I was more of the hardware side of the house. So that night, Tom goes home and looks through his stuff in his garage. I go home and look through my stuff in my garage. And we come up with a procedure to power this thing back up. And then I kind of stepped out of the picture and Tom pretty well took over. So. Skylab, when it shut it down, this is sort of a goofy little picture here, but the, what I'm trying to show is that when Skylab was powered down, this is the Earth, normally it was going around like so and the sun's out there, okay? But when we powered it down, they put it in a gravity gradient mode so that as it goes around the Earth, this point is always pointing toward the center of the Earth. That's what I'm trying to show, okay? Well, Apparently, the NORAD people had called and said, Skylab is wobbling and the orbit is decaying. Quote, wobbling. <laughs> so, what are we going to do? Well, 
we came up with a scheme to power it back up. So they powered it up. Do you need that other slide back? <laughs> so we powered, they came up with a way. I think they went out to, this was going to be tough duty, so I think they went to Bermuda to send the commands up, you know, <laughs> Houston. So powered the thing up normally, sent up some new maneuvers that would uh, fly this thing with, with the, with the pointy end, okay, that's space talk, right? With the pointy end in this direction. The problem was the Earth is here, the sun's out there, had a bunch of solar flares, and the Earth atmosphere had kind of expanded in one direction. So the problem was coming around like so, it runs into this and was slowing it down. Well, the idea was we'll turn around and we'll fly it around so that as it goes around the Earth, the minimum area hits the atmosphere. Well, that worked for a while, but then apparently the sun went through some more flares and the atmosphere just kind of expanded everywhere. So now we're staying in the atmosphere and ultimately that brought it down. But those unreliable memories <laughs> operated air free until re entry. Now, this sucker had been sitting out there in space for years, no control, no telling what the temperatures or anything was. Down they went. So, Arts code is everything. So we finished this and we did some other things. We actually we actually put a uh, yeah, well, I'll talk about that if anybody asks me. Okay, so now another program hits the dirt and I go work on its army program, still with IBM, called SECRAC. Woo. System Engineering Cost Reduction Assistance Contract. Now, I thought IBM dreamed that name up, but they didn't. It was actually Department of Defense. <laughs> so, this sounds like an IBM. If you have a big five military project, you have to have a SECRAC contractor who has no skin in the game. You're, this contractor is to advise the government on things that the, con the main prime contractor is proposing, and we're supposed to look at ways of improving the system engineering, improving, uh, making cost reduction. So I had two responsibilities. First was working on this lead analyst on this time power simulation. Now I'm going from really worrying about the ones and zeros to Fortran. So I go back to class, and get some smarts on the Fortran, and then we go back to radar classes. We took I think we had three semesters and it was taught by uh, Dick Gilbert, the guy that started Dynetics. He was a terrific, terrific instructor. So we worked on this thing. The time power, well, wait a minute. Okay, well, and then an OS cost model, and we'll get to that one. All right, so Patriot basically have radar control station launchers. Then you have a bunch of communication equipment that ties into this thing. At the time, all we had was just the PAC-2 uh, PAC missile, that number four missile up there. We didn't have the PAC-3 at the time we were working on this thing. So basically what we did is we put together this simulator that we could simulate a fire unit. Fire unit is a radar and the engagement control station. When you send out a pulse for the radar, you got to wait for it to go out, wait for it to come back, then you got to process it in the radar, then you got to hand it over to the computer, then he's got to say, well, is this a bad guy, a good guy, what do I do? So these type of things are taking time, and of course the power is how big a pulse am I sending, how many pulses am I sending, depending on the, the waveform. So what we were trying to do was put this thing together, and it worked quite well. We were the first to put together a full engagement simulation. Now that sounds like, oh, that's big stuff. Basically, you've got the Defense Intelligence Agency, Oxymoron. Defense Intelligence <laughs> Agency is, is telling us that when the Eastern European countries attack Western Europe, then they're gonna come through the Fulda Gap and these are the kind of planes and stuff they're gonna fly. Remember now, we're still shooting at airplanes at this point in time. Patriot was defending the Fulda Gap against Eastern <coughs> European attack. Okay. Luke, did it take 60 seconds to decide whether to launch or not? 
Uh, not really. No. No, it, it, that would be pretty quick. Yeah. We could do 60 seconds and that would, in, that would detect and launch to intercept and it's all done in 60 seconds. So yeah, it, it was quick. Yeah, I simulated 60 seconds was we could run this thing for 60 seconds before we blew a fuse on our 370 million frame. <laughs> it would run about four hours and produce a stack of printout. And of course, you know, you go thumb through all that, you plot all this, and darn, that wasn't the right number. Okay, we'll go and put it again. But this worked out quite well, and we used this to, to resolve a lot of Defense Science Board uh, complaints. They would come in and say, well, we think, you know, because of this time and this power, you can't do so and so. And we would run this well. You're right, we can't do it. However, we can make this simple change in software area and we can meet it so, uh, pretty well. Then, we, then they took these and went into the, uh, what do you call the guys that do all the operations research guys? But then take that and say, okay, now we've got this deployment in the full gap and how would we respond against the, the whole shooting match and play World War III, I guess. Okay, the other one now is operation and support cost model. This was a fun job. I really enjoyed this because you learn everything there is to know about how the Army operates. You take Patriot unique stuff, okay? I've got equipment that's unique. I've got personnel that operate it and maintain it that are unique. So you take that and say, okay, that's my basis. Then you go and you take the Army regulations and it says, Okay, I got that many people, then I got to have so many clerks, and I got to have so many of this and so many of that. And you start rolling this stuff up. Well, Martin Marietta had, was building Pershing missile, and they had gone to Johns Hopkins University, their st uh, statistics folks, and they had actually generated a bunch of statistics that says, if you buy a truck and you pay this amount for it, every year, as a percentage of that number, if I pay $100,000 for it, uh, first year, 2% is going to cost them operate and maintain. Next year, uh, to maintain it. The next year is going to cost 3%. The next year, 5 The next year, 10 The next year, whatever. And so these numbers were generated. So we put all that stuff in there. So when the Army regulation says we need a truck, then we know how much it's going to cost us in the out years. So we were generating the cost of this thing for 20-year life of the program. Very, very interesting. A uh, huge database just, you know, <laughs> we were down to where we could tell you how many chaplains and cases of hymn books we needed to support Patriot. <laughs> so General Street, who was, he was a piece of work, you know. But he would go up there to Pentagon, and they would start beating him over the head and shoulder about, well, you know, you don't know that. He said, how many chaplains and hymn books you think we need for this program? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard of. He goes down through that big stack of printout, you know, we had them all tabbed for him, you know. He goes, it cost me this much for chaplains and hymn books and you know. How many battlefield excavation and placement? That's a show. How many, <laughs> how many battlefield and placement excavation devices do you need? We need this many. Okay, we'll give you production. <laughs> anyway, a few years later, I mean, when this ended, I went to North Carolina with IBM. And I've been there a few months, and we got, I got this letter that uh, he had, General Street had sent to the head of IBM saying that we had showed how to save one and a half billion dollars for Patriot. I got raises out the gazoo from that letter for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. As opposed to what? Cost As avoidance for, for what? Say again? What was the cost avoided? Uh, what, what we found was that they wanted to uh, they wanted to when you have Patriot, I gotta be careful. When you have Patriot and you have these missiles, you gotta store them in a warehouse somewhere, okay? This thing's defend Europe, so the warehouse is in Europe. All right, now in order to make sure that you know your missiles are good, you have to take some out and fire them every year, all right? So the idea was we'll take them out, we'll ship them back to White Sands and test them. Well, we started running this thing, you know, and it's like 
you know, you just don't call FedEx and say, hey, I got a couple hot missiles down here. Would you mind shipping them out to White Stand? Uh, it's a very, very expensive process. So we showed that we could save in shipping costs enough to build a certification facility in Europe. So that's the gist of it. Okay? So far, so good? Anybody going to sleep yet? Okay, well, quick rundown here now. At this point, I took a digital technique class. I got some processor stuff. And in the 70s, we had technical journals and things were coming out, started talking about integrated circuits and so on and so on. Uh, a couple of these self-teaching classes. McGraw-Hill had a continuing education class that was very good. I took that. So I'm teaching myself this stuff over the period of a few years. The 60s, computers primarily mainframes except the specialized real times. The 70s, the T squared L's come along. Boy, this is just a shot in the arm for regular development. In the 70s, the Intel processors allow an awful lot of uh, you know, applications to come along. I prepared during this time, I got all this stuff together. And I, luck would have it, neighbor moves in across the street, and he's engineering rep for Intel. So he gives me all kind of education material you can imagine. So I put together this class on the 8085 and the semiconductor basics, which I got out of IBM uh, research and development journals, and started teaching these classes. Well, 1980, IBM's not going to rebid the contract with the Army, so I either have to quit or go to Charlotte. So why they choose that? What Charlotte? To not rebid. That's another long story. Uh, <clears throat> IBM used to, which nobody does anymore. Used to basically, if you work for the company, you're guaranteed employment. And the concern was that when Apollo ended, we wound up with an awful lot of people uncovered as far as jobs. So the question was, how many people can the corporation absorb if we lost every government contract we had? And that number was 10,000. Based on that, they said, Federal Systems Division can never be any bigger than 10,000. Where is the big money on FSD? Oh, that's this bunch over here. Well, little Saturn stuff has gone away. A little bit of work we were doing here kind of gone away. So a lot of the sites that were smaller sites got dissolved and we went into the company. Now this to me is a real plus for the fact that these research and development programs teach an awful lot of stuff that we use to get these jobs. Now, I taught this crazy class, I just did this on my own, but they said, hey Luke, why don't you go to Charlotte and guess what they want me to do? Teach microprocessor classes. <laughs> wow. So IBM Charlotte was just getting started. About a two and a half million square foot facility. This is one big place. 6,000 employees. We had one little building over there that they did circuit boards. We turned out 250,000 circuit boards a week. And those are, uh, those are like, those are like these kind of circuit boards. This is not little stuff you stick in a, you know, little whatever. These are pretty good sized boards. And uh, so, quite a sight. You know. Okay, so I went over and taught microprocessors, uh, use hand lettered handouts that I'd used before. Uh, we bought this box that was a suitcase. Bottom of the box is like this little picture here. I didn't have a picture of the actual one, but it looked just like this. And then in the lid, there were interfaces. So we had motors, we had A to D's, D to A's, lights, displays, all kinds of little gadgets that now you have to program this Intel 8085 processor to operate. And class handouts were, you know, my handouts were just hand lettered. We didn't have any fancy graphic stuff in those days. 40 hour class taught over three weeks and people take these processors home with them. Every, everybody in the class gets one. Uh, there were people coming in to work on this, uh, in this card plant. And, uh, 
when I, the, the week I left, I had a guy come to me. I would have people all the time coming up to me. Man, that's the best class I ever had. I've used it. And it kind of makes you feel pretty good sometimes. I told them I'd do that for one year, and then I want to get in development, and went into printer lab. So this is probably going to, I'm going to run out of time. So what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about printers. This, this is kind of interesting. This is where I finally get to a point where I'm applying the software, I'm applying the hardware, and I'm putting it all together. Okay? And this is where the, I think that NASA has missed the, the boat by not doing a little more chest beating about it. Look at all these people now that have left this program and gone elsewhere. This first printer I'm going to talk about, we made over $500 million revenue for the company out of this one machine. And we produced uh, one, two, three, four, four, four models of this thing. All of them produce about the same. So that's a pretty good return on the investment, I thought. They only gave me $5,000 for it. <laughs> so anyway, transfer and work on these impact printers. Now, the impact printer is I've got a hammer and I'm hitting a, a dot in a, or right. something and I'm putting a, a smudge on the paper. They used to say, if you can smudge paper, IBM can find a way to make a printer out of it. And that's about the way it was in those days. So we wound up, I've got electronic software, magnetic servo motors and one thing or another. I'm a lead engineer on one of these for several years. Okay, this is what it looked like. Uh, it's just a printer, it's about, uh, stands up about so high, about right at 40 inches square, think of it that way, okay? The lid raises up like this other picture over here. The paper feed mechanism is, watch my fine pointer, right in here, so your paper is going up here. There's a print band that's laying in here where that yellow line is, and that's what this thing is. This is one of the print bands off of that thing. And so what we actually had is we had a, uh, a band with these chevrons in it. Hang by, folks. And each one of these little chevrons on this thing, we put a little print on it. So this thing sits in the machine, and it's between two uh, idle pulley over here and a flywheel over here. And it's going around like so, 20 some odd inches a second, I think. Then we have these 46 hammers. And as the dot goes back, you go out and hit the dot. So what you do is you print a row of dots, you move the paper the distance between the row of dots, and you print the next row of dots. Mm -hmm. So this gives you all points addressable printing, which at that time, wasn't possible with an impact printer, okay? So my next slide here kind of shows an aerial view of it. <laughs> you see the drive wheel and then you see the print elements on the band going around either and drive wheel, the fan fold paper, paper feed motor to step it through. Uh, lower picture here shows a picture of the print band and these are the emitter, the elements that, I mean the uh, the emitter track that we use to generate the timing for this thing. We used a phase lock loop on this thing to keep track of the thing so that as you print heavier, you're, you're going to slow down some and you know you get some speed variation. So by going with the uh, phase lock loop, we were able to track that and get everything timed the way the thing should print. Ribbon now goes around, there's about uh, 100 yards of ribbon in the box got this thing and the ribbon is coming across and you're just beating the fool out of that ribbon, okay? So as you print all these dots, ribbon actually comes across the print band sort of slope, not sloping that much, but it's sloping, all right? So that you're printing kind of diagonally across the ribbon. Now as the ribbon goes and stays in the box, we had to determine, okay, how long does it have to stay in the box before the ink that you've used up gets replaced by ink seeping onto the dots that you just printed, okay? <laughs> Wow. Space science, right? <laughs> How many times you had to do that in a rocket ship, right? So we had to determine that, and that's how you wind up with it. It's around 100 yards. I don't remember the exact number. Bunch of ribbon in there anyway. 
Is that, that's very similar to tape drive uh, memory for computers as well, the way, the way that the... Yes, tape similar, drive yeah, has. similar, yeah. Except there was a vacuum and this just stuffs it in there and pulls it out the other end. Okay? All right, now the circuitry, this is a loop tally hand written picture from, what is that, 87? Yeah. And if you notice, we have, I've got three things noted here. The 8088 processor, that's what attaches to the computer that's talking to you. Now, depending on the interface, that attachment card would be have a different, uh, you know, connector on it, and would have different logic in it depending on the type of computer you're talking to. Now, the 186, the attack, the, the computer system is sending down says, "Hey, I need to print this stuff." So, the 186 says, "Okay, give me a line of print." Okay, I got this line of print, so many characters of these kinds of fonts. <laughs> Now, I gotta take those stupid fonts apart and change them into dot rows, okay? Mm. So he churn, churn, churns, separates them all out into dot rows, and then he hands that over to the 8096 that says, print this row of dots. Now he's gotta determine which one of those 46 hammers do I fire, and where is that dot going 90 to nothing around this thing so that I can hit it at the right spot. At the same time, I'm moving this paper between rows of dots, okay? Got a stepper motor on this thing that's, we'll get to it in a minute, you wouldn't believe, and he has to control that. The 8096 controls the firing of the printer, of the hammers, and the uh, movement of the forms, okay? We had an early print issue on this thing where we're printing, and as it gets heavy, the, the lines down the page are kind of wavy. Okay, the heavier your print, the more wavy they get. Well, the mechanical engineers, they're out doing all their stuff, and they're like, so and so and so and so, you know. But I got to look at that thing, and I said, man, you know, that servo we got in there is pretty wicked. So my theory was that that servo, it's got, I don't know, it's hot gears, okay? It turns out, my theory was that shaft right there was flexing, it's torquing, it's twisting. And they told me, Tally, you're full of, well, don't say what they told me, but anyway, I said, well, guys, that's your problem. Until you fix that, it ain't ever going to get done. Well, they pitched a fit, so finally I went to the management and said, okay, let them fix it. Finally, he told them, one of the guys says, hey, go beef up that shaft just to shut Tally up. Okay? He beefed it up, and it worked. That's <laughs> 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 <Too shitty. laughs> Yeah, this senior guy, he was kind of, he was one of the, he was, well, I should, well, I'll say it anyway. We, we Alabama guys had to be real careful in IBM. We got a lot of, we got a lot of sophisticated Northeasterners that really thought we were just, <clears throat> so they used to come and ask me, well, uh, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from, I'm a RN from LA and I went to MIT. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, they walk off. He didn't know that meant rednecks from Moore, Alabama went to Morehouse Institute of Taxidermy. <laughs> <laughs> Those were fun days of happy. Okay, so anyway, we used a Linac, which is this linear actuator type of a thing, and we have stators. We have this, this coil here and a bobbin, which is just a something to wind the coil on. We have this stator, there's one on the bottom and then there's one up here on the top. So there's one on each side of the slider. The slider is this little guy here and it has these four poles which are just horizontal pieces of metal, okay? So the slider's sitting in there and the stator is up here. So you pulse that coil, you drive that thing out, hits the paper, hits the uh, dot, drives it into the, uh, into the uh, ribbon and into the paper and you make a dot for it. Slide rebounds and winds and ready to go. This is the circuit we use. This is what I was talking about a minute ago. Now, this may, may wish you'd never seen this, but this is a neat little circuit. The problem is, if you pulse that thing and you don't, not real careful, it won't get back out of the way before the next dot comes by and gets it, okay? So, we have two transistors, the uppers and 
a PN, PN, and NPN. And so what we do is we turn them both on for 128 microseconds. Okay? And so the slider starts moving outward. Okay? Now, we turn that upper one off. Now the current can't go from the 60 volt supply anymore, but the field has increased in the, uh, in the uh, coil. The field is collapsing, okay? Hadn't gone to zero, it's, it's collapsing. So there's still field collapsing, still driving current through here, around through this tire. And he sits there and he just does his thing as that field slowly collapses for about 162 microseconds and you see it starts decaying down. Start out, we went up to about 2.8 amps, down about 1.8. Now at that point, we turn them both off, both transistors. This is me, because now, where's that current going to go? It goes, collapses, drives the current around here, into the power supply, around this path like so. So I'm dumping all that energy back into the capacitor in that power supply. And that way you get this real quick decay. Now at this point, hits the paper, okay? Now he's got 380 microseconds to get back to get ready to do it again. So this guy, was, he was going like gangbusters when he was printing. How'd you come up with your timing intervals? And boy, we fiddled with that for weeks. Yeah, I can't I made a test bed and we had, for each of these time intervals, I had a, uh, a thumb wheel, remember the thumb wheel switches? Yeah. And, I got, and I had a one, one megahertz oscillator. Oh, so I dial in how many microseconds, how many, what's my count? Yeah. Yeah. So many, so many microseconds, dial 168 and, and, and we'd try it. And we'd run it and run it and run it and I mean we ate up bands like you would not believe before we finally came up with that. But I always thought that was really interesting. Without that, the inductive kick just eats this thing up. The early printer before this one, we actually used uh, it was a bipolar, you know, T squared L, sort of a T squared L control. It turns out the inductive kick was so bad on the thing that it just ate that thing up. So when we went to this, we actually used uh, International Rectifier came out, uh, came down to visit us, and we told them what we were trying to do and the problems we were having. He said, "Well, yeah, you take those PNPs and they're so quick and the dials are so slow that you actually will get actually get this." inductive kick before this this nice smooth deal comes along. Went to the MOS devices, we this it worked great. And they were they saved our mm. so I got a quick question about the reliability of these electromechanical systems and how your experience from trying to develop reliability in Skylab and Saturn, how that plays into <laughs> when when you're going into this because I can imagine those hammers failing and things like that when you Yeah the hammers we we spent a great deal of time developing the hammers themselves. The hammers were not as big a problem as what I'm getting ready to talk about. And this circuit here, man, this was just great. This thing was solving a lot of difficulties as far as dealing with the, with the inductors and so forth. Overall reliability, most of these machines, uh, we would run them for uh, five years, a five year life with so many, so many hundred thousand dots per month, and then we'd run them for how many months in the chambers, and we had to run them. These machines were made to operate in uh, fairly rough environments, like on a, uh, like a shipping uh, platform or something, not necessarily outdoors, but the doors right next to it. So they had to operate in low humidity, high temperature, high humidity, low temperature, all that, so we, we beat these poor things to death. And then we got into East, got into European and American paper. Just <laughs> shoot me, man. <laughs> <laughs> Americans, you know, we make paper, we go through trees like fat meat going through a goose, you know, we don't, we don't sweat it, we just knock them down. <laughs> but Europeans don't have that many trees, so their binder in a lot of their paper is actually clay. Uh -oh. Now let me tell you something, this printer, in hot, wet environment, printing on clay paper oh. is like, you would not believe it. Man, I'm telling you, we finally had to tell them that if you're gonna print with that paper, we're gonna have to lower the speeds and everything guaranteed. We just simply couldn't do it. 
It was, it was just like, you, it's just like sticking your finger in a wad of mud. <laughs> okay, the stepper motor now we use on this thing, we gotta move this paper between the dots. So we gotta scoot. Paper's accelerating, now you space guys, you ain't got nothing with us. Paper accelerating, going forward, 22 Gs. To stop it, 33 Gs. We got a 60 volt, power supply, we're pumping this thing with pulses, six and a half amp pulses with a 45 nanosecond rise time. This was the most incredible little motor you ever saw. I don't know if you can tell, but the rotor is actually a magnetized disc, okay? It's a little flat disc. And the picture up there shows it has north-south segments all around it. So 200 and what, 240 or 200 steps per evolution. So I pulse it, it moves 1.8 degrees. Thing had acceleration, and, and one day I was in there, and we had this machine running, and it was just everything was going south, you know. Had the lid open, and one thing, and this thing went nuts, and the paper advance circuit just turned on, and it shot the paper out of the machine all the way up to the ceiling before it ever curled over. It was accelerating so fast it didn't have a chance to fall over. It just came out right on that. <laughs> but uh, this is this machine. This motor is used quite often today. If you need a low inertia uh, system, you know where you have to have a real quick acceleration, starting and stopping. And of course, being a stepper, uh, you can control it any way you want. You can speed it, step it slowly, and it'll go slow or very fast. You can really get going. So it had rocket launching capability. It could do it. Yes, it sure could. That was a, that was a wicked little motor. I meant to bring one, but I forgot. Okay, the paper feed tractors now. All this starting and stopping. Okay, first tractor belt we made was made out of rubber, corded rubber, like a tire. This thing with this rapid start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, it melted the rubber. <laughs> well, you talk about something that really goof up a tractor set is a bunch of rubber dripping down in it. So we said, well, shoot, that didn't look too good. So we went to, the second test was we went to Kevlar belts, stuff that, you know, what? Do lolly things are made out of. Uh, vests. Bulletproof vests. Yeah. So we tried that, and the, the pins now are still plastic. So these little pin things, it's going to catch on the paper. They're plastic. So. It's going so finally we got it to where we could run enough to run a, a semi life test, and the pins wore out. Ah, son of a gun. So, third Kevlar with stainless steel pins. Can you imagine? And that thing would run forever. The biggest problem was occasionally the Kevlar would actually break, and that's what that little replacement kit over there was like. Okay? Now, this is the fun. The early one was a thing called a clicking hammer, and I thought I bought a, brought a clicking hammer, but I couldn't find the one thing. And the clicking hammer basically has this little hammer, got a little thing up here, uh, a solenoid back here, and there's a magnet up here that holds it in place. So you fire the magnet and you drive it into the paper, drive it, hit the dot, it comes back. Well, this little magnet up here had to be really strong and really small. And when we get through, this is one of them, and you could come up here and stick it on this thing or find something metal, but don't get your fingers between it, because it will just pinch the thumb out of it. Where your credit Rare earth magnet, okay? So, gotta have a special chamber to have it magnetized. So chamber could affect nearby airplane nav navigation. <laughs> we were in the approach to Douglas Airport. Uh -huh. So they said, well guys, we gotta fix that. So operator puts the assembled hammer in the magnetiz magnetizing chamber, pushes a button, that sends a signal to the FAA tower at Douglas. They don't have an airplane within 20 miles. They push another button and it allows us to magnetize the hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so that's not exactly something you expect 
right. and you're making a printer. <laughs> so, so 20 mile radius? Yeah, they were a little bit concerned. Well, would it have been easier to send that to another IBM facility? <laughs> well, it only takes a few seconds. Of course, this magnet was on. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Man, let me tell you, I can't tell you how many times we had to go get new credit cards. <laughs> <laughs> now, crazy stuff number two. We're in the chamber, cool temperature, low humidity. And every once in a while, the computer shuts down, the, the, the interface to the computer. So it's printing, and I went in there and said, well, I'll just stay in here and watch it. So things just print, 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 and all of a sudden, sap loses. Go back there, and there's an arc from the paper to the connector. I mean, there's a big old blue arc. We got our field meter, and we were seeing 100,000 volts charge build up on that thing. Oh, all the paper. And with these kind of with these kind of hammers, your your uh, your throw distance is very very tight. So we had a ribbon shield, and with a little tiny slot where the dots are going to go through. Otherwise, it just gets paper going to get smudged. Well, very tight to this ribbon shield, which I think was nylon. You know. Uh -huh. And so this paper is very tight, and it's coming through that, and it's moving very fast. You know, and it just built up. A wicked chart. So we had to add a, a, a carbon brush. We tried all kinds of stuff, but there was this one company that made this carbon brush, and you right above the print line you had this carbon brush and then it's grounded. Because the paper's an insulator, so if the charge builds up, you can't just touch it and discharge it unless it gets up to 100,000 volts. So you put the carbon brush, and the brush is just basically a, a touching the paper and bleeding the charge off of it. And that's pretty common. Wow. How much time do I have? I'm going on forever here. Well, no, maybe another 15 minutes. All right. Okay, well, IBM decided that uh, they're going to move printer development to Lexington. This wasn't the move I wanted to make. They passed me over for senior engineer and ticked me off, so I wasn't going to go with them. And then I had a feeling they were going to get rid of the printer business anyway. Well, within a year, that group is now Lexmark. Yep. So I stayed in Charlotte and decided, IBM decided they need engineers that could program, so I'm not sure whether my career took a right turn at this point or 180 degrees, mm -hmm. but they sent me back to computer science class part-time and working part-time. Regular job is going to be in check processing. Okay, I go through this real quick. Check processing checks the courtesy amount down there is the part that we actually use to process checks. The legal amount is really the legal number, so you can put anything you want in the courtesy amount, and whatever you write is the real number. That's right. But this is the way the world goes. IBM 3890 checks order is this big old long thing, and basically the banks were legally required are legally required to keep an image of every check they get front and back. Before it was done with a microfilm camera. Okay, so we replaced the microfilm camera with a digital camera, 240 pel I think is what we used, and photograph front and back and so forth. This thing would sort of like 2400 or something. But this is one big machine. It'd be greater than 100 feet long. There's a number of banks in New York that have uh, these things. Check processing. Now we're in we're in the in the late 80s here now. Uh, I mean early 90s. Yeah, early 90s. Okay, so we did all this stuff, and we came up with this image processor was going to be developed and you're going to read your handwritten numbers off of this. So if you go down to a Dibo machine and you put in your check, there's a good chance that's our software reading your check. These things, we sold this stuff all over the world. Fit on software, fit on six diskettes. Three and a quarter, sold for $125,000. We had people standing in line to buy it because they could save banks huge amounts of money. Royal Bank of Canada installed a system in there one time and they were processing one and a half million checks a night. 
That is a lot of stuff. Okay. Okay, this thing uses sort of a neural network, which is a trainable algorithm. And so we would get checks from all over the world and we would train these things. We display them, we capture the image with the 3890 camera, display it on the display. We hired college students come in, they draw a box around, say, in this box is a three, or whatever. And then uh, put it back in the image, the box, and the ID would be kept in, uh, the, on the computer disk system. And then we would use this to update the font tables. Font tables are not images. We're not saying this looks like a three and does it match it? No. It's all statistics. Okay? Uh, when I retired, I think we trained on seven and a half million characters. Uh, we could recognize 90% of the numbers that we saw. The bank said they needed 50% record capability in order to make, make it profitable so we do pretty well. You start out with the courtesy amount number and then you think of it as, as being pixelated. Your image divides up into pixels and then we do the recognition. So what they would do is they would go to the center of the block of memory and draw, follow these radial lines outward. You go out so far and how many dots are that way, how many dots are that way, how many that way, how many that way, and a bunch of other statistics parameters. For each number, they would generate 64,000 statistical parameters. Okay? Then they take those 64,000 and through another statistical process, beat them against the numbers that we've already seen, all the other threes and twos and whatever, and combine that so that you're training your algorithm. You're, the more you look at it, the smarter you get. Okay, pretty neat system. Like I say, these statistics are statistically combined with the existing statistics for the number. How many statistics can you put in one sentence? This is kind of simplified, but it was more complicated than that. But recognition is not all there is. It ain't all statistics. 135.98, wrote that on your courtesy mount, no problem. 98 over 100, yeah, a little bit harder because you got that fraction line. Now you got the fraction line that's touching. Now you got a fraction line with God knows what written under it. I worked on this for a while and I was so glad to get out of this job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hated that task. Okay, so we did this in 3898. It was built using a gearbox. This is an industrial PC built by IBM. Each one of those cards, uh, yeah, this is one of them. This is actually the where I've got graphics cards and so on. This is actually the 486 card. So these are the size cards that, that were used in the machine. The graphics card, each one of those has three 32-bit uh, IBM-made processors, special graphics processors that were made by IBM in Great Britain. They're called Cotswold processors. Gearbox connected to the mainframe by a handful of token rings. As I said before, we sold this stuff for a chunk of money. The RECO code took about 36 hours to compile. This is on a DOS-based OS2 PC, okay? Uh, the 186 processor had both fixed and floating point, so we were trying to figure out how to speed this thing up. So I went in, it was a three-step compiler we compile, put everything into registers, and then compile, put everything into registers, and then compile, and finally he gets the answer. Well, in these steps where he's got everything in registers, I wrote some code to go in there and fake it out to where it would think the floating point registers are also fixed point registers. And then for the other two steps, it was having twice as many registers. And we got it down to about 16 hours. Doesn't sound like much, but it's a whole lot better than 26 or 32, whatever it started out, okay? By the mid-90s, we began looking at a replacement. We replaced it with three token ring connected PCs. By 97, the PCs were capable enough to do the job. And now the bank can add however many computers they need to increase their throughput. And this is where we were working with the Royal Bank of Canada in Toronto because they had, I think they had six PCs. They were really Okay, how long have I got now? I'm on my last chart. Oh, 
Right. Ain't gonna believe it. That'll be good. Hour and a half. Oh well. Anyway, <laughs> in '98 they announced check processing bins would be sold, uh, and by then we were no longer guaranteed employment. We could go into business, quit or retire. Not allowed to move to the IBM. Sort of feel like start moving. Mm. You know, piece of cattle. So I had 31 years, so I retired. We moved back here. One of our daughters was, was moved back here, uh, finished graduate school in Tuscaloosa, and was living here. Worked for CAS or Edo CAS or ITT CAS or Wiley CAS. They changed it every six months. <laughs> and basically, it was the same contract that IBM had when I left in 98. It was a SECRAP type contract on Patriot. Wow. So I won't bother you anymore with that except. In 1977, we were shooting down airplanes, and by 1980, we were getting ready to shoot down missiles. The thing that is amazing today is in 1977, we're really, really doing good to shoot these planes down. And now you're to the point where the system has gotten so accurate, I think a lot to do with digital systems, that today you launch that missile, you talk to it, couple of times at the most from the ground and says, hey, there's a bad guy over there, go get him. And that doggone missile just goes over there and runs into it. Don't have a warhead anymore. The kinetic energy is so great going out versus the missile coming in. You just hit them and they just, and they're left, you know, no dust. Missile. And the idea was with the warhead, if you get close to a warhead, if you get close to an incoming warhead with your missile, and you set off a charge or something, and you sort of scatter it around. Well, if it's a biological or chemical or nuclear, you just spread the mess around. It hadn't really helped a lot. So the hit to kill is the way it goes today. And I just, today, it just blows my mind. Uh, you guys are space enthusiasts. October the 6th, 1946, Montgomery, Alabama. This, I don't know, draconid or draconid or how you pronounce it, meteor shower. This was the most unbelievable thing I ever saw in my life. We were finishing up supper, and neighbors, go outside and look up. I just turned five, and this is a painting of some whatever. It doesn't even come close. They were estimating 10 to 12,000 meteors an hour. Wow. And I don't know how many of you saw that. But that was That's the one my mama told me about. Sight. Yeah, that was just mind-boggling. Okay, I'm sure you've had more than enough. <laughs> hey, say, Luke, can, can you mention about the Y2K problem? Was that oh. a real problem? Yeah. Y2K, woohoo! <laughs> Y2K came along and so they start trying to figure out what's, what we need to do. Well, there was this processor that was an AS, I think it was an AS400, I believe, uh, computer, IBM computer. And it's in the bank, it's in the back of the bank operation, you know, typical brand. <coughs> and so they start looking through, seeing, well, can we find a problem? Turns out there was a piece of code in that thing that had been left in from test days. And this this thing had been around a long time. And the code said if year code equals zero zero, read the hard drive. So these things are all over the world. Yeah. And this was a piece of test code so that when they shut the test down, they just load in the date of 00, zero for the year. Yeah. So when 2000 comes along and that 00, zero pops up, <coughs> then the yogurt. This is probably five years before, but they were able to get, get the fixes out. To, what were those computers to, used on? In banks dang near every branch bank in the world. <laughs> so we almost all wound up broke, huh? That would have not been a pretty sight, <laughs> that's to say the least. <laughs> yeah. The fact so. that this Y2K ended with a member and not a bank as a testament to all the software engineers that fixed the problem. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And that were probably just, that's probably just, you know, in the beginning. And I can't tell you the number of people that told me, so what was the big deal? Yeah. <laughs> because of that, that's why. Yeah. Uh, any questions would be on. Um, thank you so much for tonight. I met you as a coach. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Show up and oh my God, I got on. 
The um, question I have is not a technical question. It's kind of a soft question. I was wondering, um, you, know, you, you worked for a lot of different bosses during your career. Oh, yeah. I was yeah. wondering, could you describe, you don't have to give a name or anything, but just describe your favorite boss, uh, what you thought of her. How many in here know Fred Clark? Anybody know Fred? You're saying. Fred started CAS, C-A-S, Clark and Stender. Fred Clark and Bill Stender started that. Fred was my manager when we were working on Patriot. Of all that I ever had, uh, Fred, <laughs> everything's going away. You know, I'm going to Charlotte, and one thing or another, the IBM's not going to rebid the contract. So Fred says, Luke, would you like to come work with us to start this? Well, no, Fred, you know, that's kind of risk. And I got this daughter and two daughters, and I think I'll stay with IBM. Well, Fred's up in Tennessee with $75 million in his pocket. I'm standing here talking to you folks. <laughs> <laughs> should listen to him. <laughs> I should have listened to Fred. <laughs> but he was, he was by far just, you know, he's, he's top of my hero list, no doubt about it. Yes. Yes, sir. How much did that printer sell for? The what? The printer. The that particular printer, I think, was... Uh, there were two models, and I think this one was fifteen thousand oh, dollars. Not all the work. Not too bad for the time and the, the day. Today you would say that's the sorriest looking print I ever saw. <laughs> At the time, to give you the all points addressable, now you could do some, some graphics. And by the print, the print band, uh, you can see the little print elements on the outside. We had three different sizes, so if you were going to do mostly near letter quality, you can get a smaller print element. Of course, you eat the ribbon up, but other than that, ribbon's cheap. <laughs> so, so during Apollo, um, I understand that a lot of people worked a lot of hours. Oh, yeah. yeah. So what was your typical work day, how many hours, and... Um, how many days? <laughs> how many days, yeah, how many days a week, man, yeah, how many hours a day? Yeah. Was it? 50 and 60 hour weeks were pretty common. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And again, that depends. During the mission, it's in the Skylab, when they're on Skylab, a lot of us spend a few nights on the desk. Sure. You know, just laying on the desk and sleep. When Skylab first went up, that was a real, that was tough. Yeah, there, there was some uh, tough times. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, the, um, the program that, uh, that learns um, does once it uh, learns a certain level, does it throw away the one before? No, no, no. It, it. That's why I say that's what a neural net does. Is it learns just like you learn. Okay. You know, I go down that street, but I might ought to wiggle around that a little more. You know, and it always remembers that little. Yeah, because with the with the print, you can't believe we would get these checks in from around the world, and people write so different. And the ones that are the killers are the British. They write so very small, we couldn't get enough pixels to record a lot of their stuff. They just, you know, they just, if you, if you can't recognize it as you're going through the thing, then you display it on the screen and someone types it in. So that, you know, we, we're doing an 80% record or whatever. And we sell them the, the system with the six diskettes, okay? And we'll guarantee you 80, 85% record, okay, or 80. Let's say we're, we're, rec we're guaranteed, we do 80. Oh, that's good, you know, so we're getting the six to sketch. We come back, uh, you know, a few years later, a couple of years later, we go to them, hey, we can make it 90. Oh, wow, yeah, good. Okay, so we sell them one more to sketch, $40,000. He's got one line of code, put it in, and it turns on something that's already in those other six to sketch anyway. <laughs> At IBM, they taught you first day, count the money this way. That's negative thinking. Always count it toward you. <laughs> was a neural network uh, built onto a computer base? Did yeah, it yeah, like it's, it's programmed in C. Was it software in that? Or hard yeah, it's software. So it, wasn't, it wasn't L? No, no. It, it was it was all software. Yeah, that most of the stuff we had in there was was vanilla C. That was another problem we had is when they would go when they went to C plus, we the banks wanted to use hey you know can, I mean not the banks, the management 
I am C plus, we can do faster than that, you know, all this wonderful stuff they've been reading on the back of the envelope somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so we started looking into it, and the problem was with C plus, you have the library function that, you know, okay, I'm, I've got this thing I want to do, and I go pull this thing out of the library. Well, the problem we found out was, as I pull that out of the library, yeah, it'll do what they say, but it's also got some other stuff down there that the way we're using it, we can get stung. So we told them, no, we're staying with C. I, I'm sure today they've changed, but at the time, uh, we were finding great difficulties trying to apply C to that kind of environment. So um, you, you did both hardware and software assignments. Was your passion more in hardware or more in yeah, software? Yeah, kind hardware. Of oh, yeah? yeah I was so it was like begrudgingly to do software. I don't mind the software uh, when, like, the picture where we've got, you know, the, the different processors doing the different tasks that are... I like that close connection between the software and the hardware. I don't. I never was one for just sitting there churning numbers. So, so how many patents are you part of? I don't have any. You don't have any. No. You're part of some. I tried. Through, yeah, I tried through IBM, a bunch right? of those stupid things, and finally said, Shh, "I ain't gonna mess with this anymore." Boy, we had some guys that had them. Though. Man, I worked with one guy. Have y'all ever heard of a pro printer? IBM made a pro printer. It was a dot matrix back in the yeah. what late '80s, I guess. And the guy I worked with on that, he had 140 some odd patents, I think. He was, of course, they would patent the shape of a spring. You know, like come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. When I was in engineering school, you could spot the engineers because they had a sword. Was a slide rule. Yeah. And so, yeah. in my second year of engineering school, a brand new little processor came out that we programmed on. It was the 4004. So I got oh, yeah. the oh, okay, yeah. screen. We got our first HP 35 when we were doing mission support on Skylab. That was the first calculator I remember. Then we got the HP 67s when we were doing the Patriot. So they, do, they launched the Patriot missile. Well, the radar uses sine alpha sine beta space, and the tracking system over here uses X, Y, Z. So you always got to do this stupid transformation. Well, Bill Stender, if you know Bill, <laughs> Bill came up, and the HP-67 had these little magnetic strips you could load in and run it, whatever. Well, Bill found this deal. I think we had six strips. You load, you punch in the numbers, you load the strip, you hit the go, and it turns, turn, turns, and saves everything in memory. And then you put the next strip in, and you hit go, and it turns. <laughs> Finally, after the sixth strip, you get the three numbers you want. You write them down, and you start over again. <laughs> yeah, so, so your character recognition, was that uh, the, uh, the courtesy block? or yeah, courtesy. Just courtesy. Because yeah. yeah. the, the rest of it's like cursive well, writing. I don't know how you do cursive. They, they do that now. Wow. Yes. yes. They, uh, the people in research took over a lot of this stuff. Uh, after I left. It must take some serious AI to read Man, cursive. it must. It must. Especially the way we all write so different. Oh, Especially yeah. the reading my writing. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we had an awful time reading a lot of stuff. You have a favorite memory from Apollo or Skylab, something short, quick? Yeah, Apollo 12. Do you all know the story of Apollo 12? S-C-U to R. S-4-B-I-U. S4BIU once. The one got hit by lightning? Well, yeah, but that's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> once the crew separated. Crew module shut down. <laughs> the, the crew would separate. They'd go out and go around the leading edge of the moon going to orbit. But we would slow that S4BIU down and take it around trailing edge. Get within 2,000 miles, you'd wind up in solar orbit. But on 12, there was some tracking problems. One of the radar systems was down, and they weren't sure about the tracking numbers, so. Houston felt that it was going too fast, so they slowed it down about 20 some odd miles an hour more. Well, instead of 2,000, the thing misses like 3,000 miles. Big high orbit about the Earth, you know, half a million miles by 70,000, about a 40 some odd day orbit. It stays in this thing for a couple of years, and there's a big discussion on how it finally winds up, whether it ultimately 
elongated to the point it got near the Lagrange point and was pulled into solar orbit, or one of these nearby passes of the Earth or Moon that got thrown into solar orbit. But it goes into solar orbit. It stays out there 30 years. And some guy out in California is looking through his telescope one night, sees this white dot, hmm, must be an asteroid. So he goes on the internet, this guy's found a lot of asteroids. Goes on the internet, says, I see so-and-so between these points on these nights. The professionals look at it and say, well, it's, it's not an asteroid because the, the trajectory could not be an asteroid. And then another group looked at it, does a spectral analysis, and says, well, this thing's covered with titanium dioxide, white paint. Don't see many painted asteroids. <laughs> so the JPL guys get into the act, and then they back figure where this thing is coming from, and they believe that it was actually the S4B IU from Apollo 12, and they think that the sun's here, the Earth's here, the Grunge point where the gravity balances, the sun's pulling that way, same as Earth's here. That point's following the Earth around the sun. Well, this thing is following who knows what around the sun. And ultimately, 30 years after it got out there, it comes back, gets near this point, and gets pulled back into, solar, back into Earth orbit again. This is 2002, I believe it was. Loops around the Earth for about, I think it was 10 or 12 orbits. Gets near the moon on one of these, whoosh, thrown back out there again. So the guy at JPL, Dr. Oh, somebody. If you go on the internet, look for J002E3. That's the space jump number for that thing. There's a whole bunch of this stuff out there. And JPL's simulation of showing this thing looping around the Earth is out there. Well, Dr. Chotis at JPL, he predicts that this thing will do this again about every 40 years. Wow. Come back around the Earth, get thrown back out there, come back and do this for about a thousand years, and at that time it'll probably hit either the Earth or the Moon. So a thousand years from now, some poor slob walking down the street is going to be in for a <laughs> big surprise. <laughs> <laughs> that's where we. That's almost the sky level. That's. I think that would be great. Yeah. Because it would just be amazing to go see what that thing looks like. See if that computer will power up. <laughs> that's it. That's it. We saw a movie once called Space Cowboys where they they took, they, they repowered a Russian version yeah, of our right. Skylab. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what was that number again? J zero zero two E three. There's a Wikipedia article about it. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a I'm JPL saying. simulation out there uh, that. Well, I didn't mean to take that much long, that long, but anyway. Well, it was all good. I'll shut this thing off. Tyler, we really appreciate it. All righty. And thank you for watching.